Our next guest speaker, um, Elizabeth Stipp, has so many titles, so many wonderful things that she's doing uh, that she's asked me to succinctly introduce her as a friend of Rhonda. So without any further ado, Elizabeth, welcome. Yeshu Shimwe. Now you have heard all the Kenya Wanda I know. I love Rhonda. And I have told all of my friends that I intend to learn Kenya Wanda before I die. I am going to learn Kenya Wanda if it kills me, and it might. Thank you so much for having me. Honorable Excellency Ambassador. Distinguished guests, all of you are my friends. Because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are brothers and sisters. We are related to each other, and we get to spend eternity together. I thank God I get to meet you this side of eternity. I can't wait to meet each other in heaven and say, remember that time we were at that banquet? <laughs> we'll wave at each other, and I'll have you over, and you'll have me over. But the point of tonight is that we are related to each other. We are here together in a common purpose. Because if you cut us, we bleed Rhonda. And you all are here for the purpose of praying for Rwanda. And how I thank you for that. How I thank you for your commitment and your love. Because God is writing a story. He is writing a story and we all are a part of it. God is writing the story of Rhonda. And you are a part of it. And by coming tonight, you are telling your brothers and sisters in Rwanda and all over the world that you have not forgotten them. Amen. And that they matter to God and that they matter to you and that you are here tonight to pray for our dear friends, your family, my family in Rwanda. So if I had my way, I'd pull up a chair and we would just get to know each other. I know you're thinking, who is this strange Mzungu anyway? I... I, I, I I confess, the way I came to love Rhonda is because partly the people that I met, Eric Munyamana, all of Benita's family, Bishop Enoch, so many friends here, the ambassador. I, I, I happened to, to, to go to this strange church in California. Perhaps you've heard of it. The pastor is Pastor Rick Warren, and it's called Saddleback. And I am a nurse. I was working in the area of HIV, and Kay Warren said to me, would you like to go with me to Africa? And I said, well, I have four children and a husband and a job. I don't think I can go. But have you ever known some people that are very dangerous? They are very dangerous. And the next thing I knew, I found myself almost 15 years ago with Bob Bradbury, who, Pastor Bob Bradbury from our church, and many others in this country that I began to love. Since then, since the early 2000s, um, my husband and I have had the privilege of going to Rwanda about 50 times. Wow. Our children joke, it's a wonderful place. Our, our children joke, when they're looking for their mom and dad, they say, they must be playing with my brothers and sisters somewhere, or maybe they're at church, or maybe they're in Rwanda. That's how much we all care. For this country that God is writing a story in, I humbly stand before you saying, there is no place like Rwanda. You know the statistics. You know the story. You have lived the story. I would love to hear your story. So what I'm going to speak of tonight, I might as well admit to you, I know nothing. And everything I'm going to share is what we, I am going to suggest that we would pray for Rwanda tonight. What shall we pray? We're here to pray for Rwanda. So what shall we pray? And everything that I'm going to suggest, Rwandans have taught me. I know nothing. I know nothing about HIV. Rwandans have taught me. I know nothing about orphans. Rwandans have taught me. I know nothing of forgiveness. Rwandans have touched me. I know nothing of the grace and the goodness of God that Rwandans haven't taught me. But there are a couple things that we might pray about tonight. Because as I went to... Rhonda, the first time, I came home and wrote Pastor Rick's wife, Kay Warren, an email in the middle of the night. And I said to her, thanks. Thanks a lot. I am ruined. Gloriously ruined. 
And it really is with that spirit that we want to pray tonight. And really what Rondas have taught me is let's pray for these four things. We're going to thank God for the things he's given to the beautiful country, the land of a thousand hills, where we all know that God roams the world all during the day and at night he sleeps in. (laughs) So this is what we can thank God for tonight. First of all, we can thank God for his presence. What I love about my brothers and sisters is that they know God in ways I don't know him. You cannot suffer in the ways that this beloved country has suffered and not know God. I, I, I know the joy of watching the love of God permeate hearts when it didn't make sense. So let's tonight thank God for his presence. Uh, I can remember on one trip taking all of our family because if you love someone, the Bible says you're, where, you're, where your heart is there, your treasure will be also. So we bring all of our friends and, and family to Rhonda. I think um, Pastor Bob would tell you that from Saddleback Church alone, about 1,500 people have gone to Rhonda. And you could go with us. We leave next week. Or you could go again in May. Just we'll help you and your church go. So all these people going, and and what we see is the presence of God in ways that is difficult to see anyplace else. So let's pray for that tonight. Let's thank God for his presence. I remember bringing my 14-year-old daughter to this country that we've come to love, and I remember working in a hospital as a nurse, and my daughter was there down the hall, and I could see her sitting on the bed of a woman who admittedly had suffered greatly. She had horrific scars on her arms, a big scar in her head. And and I began to understand the presence of God in ways I've never understood before, but that we can pray for tonight. Because as my daughter sat on this bed, I remember the woman who has had all these horrific scars, and she was telling her story to my daughter in a language that my daughter didn't understand. But there sat my daughter, and I could see her very animated. I don't know where she gets that. Um, she so, so very, very, very animated, listening to this woman who was telling her her story. And my daughter was shaking her head. And soon I could see my daughter also had tears. That is the presence of God. The idea that people's pain matters, that your story matters, and that you are not forgotten. And that is what is experienced in Rwanda. So let's pray for that tonight. Thank God for his presence. Ask for it to continue. Because every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is Jesus with skin on. And when we show up, not to do, but to just be with each other, we are being the most powerful thing we can be. The presence of the living God. So let's thank God for his presence. The second thing that may I suggest that Rwandans have taught me we can pray for tonight is for continued purpose. Rwanda is a purpose-driven nation. You know, um, Pastor Rick Warren here became president, Kagame's friends, His Excellency, the president. They became friends over purpose-driven because Pastor Rick had written this little book. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's the number one bestseller in history other than the Bible. And it was called The Purpose-Driven Life. Thank you, whatever that book is. And, uh, and, and, and then he met, someone heard that, that His Excellency President Kagame was a purpose-driven man. And he said, well, you two should meet. And that was many, many years ago. And Her Excellency the Ambassador would tell you the story that even this week, we are friends of Rhonda because of the relationship that the president has with Pastor Rick Warren. We, we had the privilege of being together in San Francisco where there was an event just like this. There was about 3,000 Rwandans. It's so much fun. You must come. And when you come, I live about, um, Bob, about 12 hours from San Francisco driving. You all are invited to our house. We are all friends now. So anytime you come to a Rwandan event. Um, and, and, I'm, and, and Pastor Bob knows I mean it. So... So as we were at, at this event, the purpose is what Rhonda has. And you'll remember that we all have five purposes in our life. All from scripture, from the great commandment and the great commission. Our first purpose is that we have the purpose of fellowship, of being in a family and community together. That it is not good for us to be alone. Where We need a place where we can be authentic, where can, we can be ourselves. And that fellowship is found in the church. A place where you belong. A place where you don't need to perform. 
a place where you belong. The second purpose of our life is maturity. That we would become like Christ. That we would know Christ. And that is what is happening in, in Rwanda. And we can thank God for that. The third purpose of our lives is ministry. Serving each other in the church. Today, if you want to have a purpose-driven life, you will begin to have fellowship in a church. Get, have maturity in a church. And ministry in a church. But our next purpose is mission. And let me tell you about people living on mission. I, I'm a guest in Rwanda, but I met with the, the Minister of Gender and Family Promotion who had this wild, audacious goal. Um, Eric Munyamana, my dear friend, told you about this idea of emptying orphanages. You know you can tell the morality of a country based on how they take care of their children. And this country is an example to the whole world. And as we met, they said, well, um, I understand the science that, it, that ch every child deserves a family of their own. I understand the biblical mandate that we are to adopt because we are adopted by God. That God made the universe so that he could adopt us. And so why wouldn't we want to adopt children or reunite children back into families? Oh, but it's so complex. But Rhonda can do it. Because as we met with the Minister of Family and Promotion, she said, Gender and Family Promotion, she said, well, how are we going to do this? And we said, through the local church. Families don't live in governments. Families don't uh, learn as much from governments, but they live in churches. I can tell you that there were people who had placed their children in orphanages with big hearts, understanding that they thought it was a great thing for children. And they took biblical truth combined with scientific truth. I love it when science catches up with the Bible. And the two combined had these families go into orphanages, children that they had placed there, and they learned that it was better for them to be back in their family, even if the socioeconomic condition in the orphanage seemed good. And I remember one man that walked three hours to a training in the church because when the, the minister said, how will we empty orphanages? We said, you cannot do it without the local church. And the local church in Rwanda, they're the ones that are saying, UNICEF is looking and, and, and other organizations, how are you doing this? How did you get this many children out of institutions into homes? And this one man walked three hours to get some training. And we said, here's the training. Your child is here. It's not good for their brain. And, and, it's, and biblically, God invented family. We are adopted by God. Let's consider reuniting and having our children back in our homes. And the man said, hmm. We said, well, why don't you go home and think about it? And I'll never forget, he stood up and he said, I walked three hours to get here. I'm walking three hours home. You just told me that, 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 that my child needs a mommy and a daddy. I will be taking him home today. That is the spirit of purpose, of mission in Rwanda. There is this big heart. I've sat in church services where you know people are making less than a dollar a day. And they will say, sister so-and-so has passed away. Who will take care of her children? There is no spirit of love like what I see on a little wooden bench. And people looking at each other and raising their hand. <laughs> Perhaps this is even your story. Some of you here know the goodness and the heart of our brothers and sisters. So tonight, let's thank God that he's made Rwanda a purpose-driven nation. People living on mission. You heard that, um, that, that Rwanda is an example to the whole world. Next week, many of us are going to Rwanda, and there are 10 other nations coming to that country to learn how Rwanda has done the community transformation they've done. And you know where they will be going to learn? You might think they might have a government seminar because there is no government like is represented. The goodness of the government with even the gender equality that's represented in your government. And the good governance is unlike any other. So you would think these 10 countries might come to a government to learn a seminar. Or maybe to the educational system. Maybe they're coming to the Rwandan University to learn about community transformation. And how do you mobilize people to change their communities and do good in the world. 
But these 10 countries will be coming to little, tiny, rural churches to learn how to change the world. That's the way Rwanda is. They're living on mission. Uh, people will say, we want to, we want to um, learn how to do this. Could, could you come to us? And people are inviting Rwanda to come to their countries to say, how did you mobilize ordinary believers in churches and empty orphanages? It's the goodness of the heart of God. In a country that could say, I have been victim, so I will be a victim. It is a country that has said, I know the love of God, so I will give away the love of God. And my brothers and sisters, that is worth praising God for tonight. That is worth praying that it will continue. And you are going to make a difference tonight just by being here to pray. So we'll thank God for his presence, for his purpose, for his pardon. There is no country that can show the rest of the world reconciliation and pardon the way that Rhonda can. You all know that the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is the story God is writing in this little teeny country that has no ability to do anything but demonstrate to the rest of the world what it is to love. What a powerful resume. What other country has as their resume. We have the presence of God, the purpose of God, and we understand the pardon of God. Everything I know about forgiveness is from my brothers and sisters, Rwanda. So let's pray for that tonight. Praise God for the way that God's pardoned. There is no shame. There is no guilt. Who else can live like this? There, the idea that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That there is no guilt. That there is no shame. That is what is exemplified in Rwanda. And how to build reconciliation. I, I think it was a friend in Rwanda who told me, Do you know that I have to forgive? And I said, I do not understand. What do you mean you have to forgive? And they said, I will never forgive someone more than what I've been forgiven of. I've never forgotten that. I, I can remember one of my brothers and sisters um, in a little, little rural church saying, we are forgiving because if I don't forgive, I am taking poison. And, and resentment is taking poison and, and thinking it will hurt the other person. And so everything I learned about the love of God is in a country we're praying for tonight. Thanking God for his presence, for his purpose, for his pardon, and his promises. You know, often when we talk about the promises of God, we think of the wonderful promises that God has given us. But I'd like to bring to your attention something that my brothers and sisters in Rwanda have taught me. That Jesus really promised us two things. He promised us that we would suffer he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. And he promised us that he would never leave us or forsake us. And that promise is what is helping families empty orphanages in Rwanda. Because they understand this might be difficult. I might be inviting pain and trauma into my home. But God left his throne to welcome us into his home. The Lord crossed bloodlines to bring us into their, his home. In adoption. And so I tell all, all my brothers and sisters from Rwanda that, that you are the experts in understanding the promises of God. The promise that you may suffer, but that God will never leave you or forsake you. And that links two things. That links compassion and courage. And when you put compassion and courage together, you can change the world. Uh, I can tell you, child after child who seemed to be unadoptable. People thought no one will love this child. That one child was, was an adolescent and depressed and HIV positive. Who would care to bring this child home? But the church in Rwanda does. There is not a child that has been up, apart from the reach of a home. And the exciting thing about what's going on in Rwanda that, that you m m would love to hear is they are not just taking kiddos into homes. They're taking kiddos into homes and doing it well. Um, tonight, I've invited some of my friends with us. Um, Dr. David Cross is here from TCU. He came from Fort Worth. And Dr. David Cross is the director of the Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development. See, when Rwanda does things, they do things well and right. And so it wasn't good enough just to have children come into families or be reunited into families. 
They wanted to do it well. And so we searched the world over and the very best curriculum and how to parent children from hard places, how to help children that have been through hard things be assimilated back into a family. The curriculum that's being used in Rwanda is being studied all over the world. It's scientifically based and, and very rural Rwanda. Is, is doing this. You have not lived till you see a family in Rwanda with a child who is not biologically theirs. Look into the child's arms and say, did God ever make someone as precious as you? And they were taught that by the late Karen Purvis, um, a, a, a professor and researcher at TCU who traveled to Rwanda many years ago. And she and I taught the social workers in the country, and the social workers taught us. I always learn way more from Rwanda than I could ever teach. But you, it is encouraging to know that your friends in Rwanda are not only taking children in, they are using this curriculum that is teaching families how to build trust, how to repair, how to have children thrive. Because you know the statistics in Rwanda. It, there's the only country that has education from 0 to 12th grade. What an amazing accomplishment. But when those children come home, they come home to loving families because of the local church. Because of the love of Christ. And Rwanda has, in their graduating rate now, is like 72%. Do you know the United States is only about 82%? And in rural areas, it's much lower. So we all have so much to thank God for tonight. And to continue to pray that his hand, that his blessing would be on Rwanda. That his presence, that his purposes, that his pardon, and that his promises would be continued to be lived out. Because you know the way we'll know that your prayers are making a difference tonight is when we get mobilized. You know, in this room, you are eligible to adopt children. You actually have two countries you can choose from. American children need your families because you fear the Lord and because you love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and all this talk seems very foreign to you, please know you are welcome and you are safe here.